Tamatea Dusky Sound is a beautiful, remote part of New Zealand and the site of many pioneering interactions by Europeans. Home now to wildlife and occasional tourists, a team from Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum and Heritage New Zealand, with the help of local tour operator Fjord and Expeditions, sets out on a mission of rediscovery. The aim is to see what remains from that historic era and share these remarkable stories of what was, for both Māori and European, the furthest frontier. Because Cook had charted Dusky Sound in such detail and also recorded that it had everything you'd want, shelter, water, food, timber, all subsequent 18th century explorers made a beeline for this spot. It's only later as Europeans became more familiar with New Zealand and its geography that they realised that actually Fiordland was the back of beyond and likely to remain that way. The next explorer to come to Dusky Sound after Cook was George Vancouver and he'd actually been here with Cook in 1773 on the resolution as a midshipman. So he was coming back to a place that held happy memories for him. But by 1791 he had risen to become commander of his own voyage of exploration on the Discovery accompanied by the Chatham. They spent three weeks here in November 1791 the Discovery moored here in Anchor Island Harbour while the Chatham parked up at Facile Harbour across the bay. And both ships had to endure a ferocious gale during their first week here but were safely sheltered in their respective coves. Like Cook's party, Vancouver's men also brewed up some spruce beer here in Dusky Sound to ward off scurvy. So this is the site of the second brewery in New Zealand. His men had actually been suffering from dysentery, so they needed a bit of rest, some good food and good water to restore their health. The ships had also endured a long, tough voyage from England, so they needed a bit of repair. They cut down plenty of trees and made a workspace, although there's no sign of those work zones here from the Discovery anymore. Vancouver extended Cook's charts of Dusky Sound and made some corrections, notably charting the Vancouver arm of Breaksea Sound. Now Cook had wondered if this might actually go right through to Doubtful Sound to the north, but he hadn't had time to check out his hunch, and so he marked it on his chart as nobody knows what. Now, 18 years later, Vancouver could work this out and determined that no, it did not go right through to Doubtful Sound, so he marked it on his chart as somebody knows what, and it was later renamed the Vancouver Arm in his honour. No Maori were encountered during Vancouver's stay here in Dusky Sound, though they looked pretty hard, especially in Indian Cove and here in Cascade Cove where parties had been found uh, during Cook's visit all those years before. The only sign of human habitation were a couple of abandoned huts in Facile Harbour. Vancouver was no doubt disappointed not to meet with any Māori around Fiordland, especially after the good relationships he had been part of during Cook's voyage nearly two decades earlier. Later European explorers also reported seeing Māori who fled on being sighted. Over the course of time between Cook and Vancouver's expeditions, historians believe that the relationships between groups of southern Māori had probably changed. By the time Vancouver returned to Dusky in 1791, Māori living here may have been doing so in fear, as a response to events elsewhere in New Zealand. James York explains. There was a few uh, discrepancies between Māmoi and Tahu, and Tahu um, was coming down. A lot of the Māmoi people were pushed to Southland and, and to Taipotini, west coast to the very uh, furthest you know, points of refuge really. So, you know, when you say, you know, people fled into the bush and that, well, that's probably why, because they were very nervous. They would be fleeing from anybody, you know, like any, anything they're unsure of, because it's all about survival. 
Vancouver went on from southern New Zealand to explore the northwest coast of America, including the Pacific coastline of the modern Canadian province of British Columbia, where the names Vancouver and Vancouver Island commemorate his historic expedition of exploration. The next exploration was by a Spanish expedition, a unique Hispanic connection in the New Zealand context, just two years after Vancouver, under the dual command of the Italian-born Alessandro Malaspina and the Spaniard José de Bustamante. Theirs was also a grand scientific expedition, modelled after the voyages of James Cook and sometimes following in his footsteps. They spent five years, from 1789 to 1794, sailing throughout the Pacific Ocean, stopping at nearly all the Spanish colonies and exploring little-known areas like New Zealand and Australia. They arrived at Dusky Sound in February 1793, but did not enter and were then blown further north to Doubtful Sound. They were hoping to make some experiments on gravity that needed to be undertaken in this latitude. Malaspina had a good look at Doubtful Sound, hoping to be able to go in there. He was using the charts of his great hero, Captain Cook, and had this to say about them. By the exact details which Captain Cook, with his usual accuracy, has given of this part of the coast, we were able, without difficulty, to make out all the points within sight. Five Fingers Point bounded our view to the south, the opening of Dusky Bay was clearly visible, and the course we followed carried us slightly to leeward of Doubtful Bay, which at nine o'clock was about two or three miles distant. It would be difficult to give a more perfect description of the ruggedness and elevation of these coasts than that given by Captain Cook on his first voyage. Two miles from the shore, we sounded in a hundred fathoms without finding bottom. And although the intermediate island showed signs of a fairly abundant vegetation, the entrance of Dusky Bay and all the coast of the port closed in with inaccessible mountainous peaks justified the captain's accounts, which have caused this port to be looked upon as dangerous to ships leaving it. Since they'd struck a fine day, Malaspina decided to undertake a preliminary investigation of the sound. So his chief hydrographer, Felipe Boza, took a small boat and for nine hours he went around the bay until darkness forced him to withdraw. What he found was that just inside the entrance was a nice deep harbour with two navigable arms, abundant wood and water, but it also confirmed Cook's doubts about its safety for sailing ships dependent on wind for their motive power. That's why he called it Doubtful Sound. And Malaspina emphasised this in his journal. Unless the chance or dire necessity brings mariners to this port, we must suppose that it is destined to be perpetually deserted and that Dusky Bay will ever remain the port of welcome in this neighbourhood, offering, as it does, a more convenient, a safer, and a healthier refuge. They planned to head into Dusky Sound the next morning, but unfortunately overnight the wind blew up to hurricane strength. And after a further day off the coast, the two ships headed off out into the safety of the open sea. And thus ended the only known Spanish exploration of New Zealand. Just nine hours here in the extremity of Doubtful Sound. Malaspina and Bustamante reached Spain in September 1794 after 62 months at sea. They had achieved much, but unfortunately, after his return, Malaspina was caught up in political intrigues and thrown into prison. He was prevented from doing anything to publish his journals. All papers and documents relating to the voyage were seized, and the scientific staff of the expedition ordered to suspend work. This severely limited its historical impact. Bozer, the mapmaker, eventually suffered a similar fate. He fled Spain and went to England, 
This map was actually published there in 1840, almost 50 years after the expedition. Now most of Bose's names haven't survived onto the modern New Zealand map, but some stuck and some have actually been reinstated. So this section of Doubtful Sound, for instance, is Malaspina Reach. We have Quintano Point over here, a little bit further on Espinosa Point. Bowser Island, named after the mapmaker himself, near the entrance of the harbour with Makassioni Point at the end where there's actually a plaque in his memory. And as we go out the sound, we hit Febrero Point, which commemorates the month in which the Spaniards were here in 1793, February. Now this little section of New Zealand is the only place where we have Spanish names like that commemorating that one magical day in 1793 when Spanish explorers looked at New Zealand and left that one little mark in our history to those names. On the next episode of Furthest Frontier, tales from Tamatea Dusky Sound, the first sealing gang arrives in New Zealand. Now they did that by the pretty simple process of just walking through a rookery, and brutally smacking the seal on the snout, killing it, skinning it, drying it. This was the first permanent European structure ever erected in New Zealand, of all places, here. Yeah. Because they are prone to fosking, which is illegal against you know, our act and the um, Protected Objects Act. Now that almost completed boat would not be forgotten, and Dusky Sound was now well on the radar of many mariners in Sydney. 